Okay, now uh, let's uh, move to the second session of this morning. The first speaker of this second session will be uh, Professor Sherry Mong. And uh, Professor Sherry Mong uh, uh, is the uh, Ziba Chair Professor in Energy Technology at the University of California, San Diego from- uh, you, you haven't got my new bio. I have moved to the University of Chicago. I know, I know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> during uh, 2017 to uh, 2022. Now, uh, uh, Professor Meng is the professor at the, uh, the Pitsko School of Molecular Engineering yeah. in uh, Chica University of Chicago. He served as the chair scientist, uh, chief scientist at the uh, Agon uh, Collaborative Center for Energy Storage Science. And uh, she is the principal investigator of the research group, Laboratory for Energy Storage and, and Conversion and uh, received uh, several prestigious awards, including the Faraday Medal of the Royal uh, Chemistry Society, uh, International Battery Association, uh, Battery IBA Research Award, and the uh, uh, American Chemical Society ACS Applied Material Interface Young Investigator Award, and the uh, uh, C.W. Tobias Young Investigator Award for uh, of the Electrochemical Society and NSF uh, Career Award. And uh, she is elected a fellow of the Electrochemical Society, fellow of Material Research Society and fellow of uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Mm -hmm. She is the author and course of more than uh, 260 peer reviewed journal articles, two book chapters and five issued patents. She is the editor in chief for Material Research Society MIS Energy and uh, Sustainability. So now uh, let's uh, welcome Professor uh, Sherry Mun. Uh, her talk uh, today will be advanced diagnostic tools for lithium metal and uh, solid state batteries. So thank you, thank you, Professor Huang, for the kind of introduction and uh, my uh, hearty congratulations to uh, the university 85 years uh, anniversary. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, everybody's uh, camera is off. I, you know, just hopefully you can see that uh, <laughs> uh, I'm actually in Sydney, Australia and uh, giving the talk virtually. So initially I was hoping, you know, the meeting could be in person, but I guess uh, we will have to wait for another few months or few, hopefully um, that things will open up uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, so I will talk about, uh, I think the last two and a half years or three years have been extremely rough for uh, folks who are doing, uh, you know, uh, I would say any academic research because um, uh, for me personally, I think the battery field really um, was one of the only industries that, uh, you know, grows tremendously during the last uh, couple of years. We haven't met in person. However, the progress uh, of all the research, just like the previous two speakers have spoken, uh, moved forward a lot. So I will give a brief update on where we are with lithium metal and uh, solid state batteries. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, since five months ago, I have moved to the University of Chicago and take the uh, role of um, chief uh, scientist for the Argonne Collaborative Center for Energy Storage Science. So obviously today's opportunity here is to um, perhaps, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, reignite the collaborations between Hong Kong and the US. Uh, we used to have quite a lot of interactions, uh, both through people exchange ideas, collaborations. Uh, I have, I know that a couple of my collaborators are actually in the audience today. Um, lithium metal batteries um, is basically, um, you know, the next generation. So we know that everybody is working on the replacement of the graphite uh, with silicon and uh, Battery 500 Consortium, as uh, Professor Manfred has mentioned, are uh, working on the replacement of the um, uh, graphite or silicon with lithium metal. On the positive electro side, I won't have time today, but perhaps in the future, uh, I have just started working on the uh, sulfur-based cathode, a lot of fun, very, very difficult uh, scientific challenges uh, compared to the layered oxide. Uh, the key here is because we know we are moving away from intercalation, going to alloying, 
and the conversion type of uh, materials. And we all know uh, for this audience, you know, I don't have to emphasize that uh, we are dealing with moving irons. You know, all the tools we build in America, particularly in uh, advanced photon source in our national lab, we used to be able to do this kind of um, uh, parental characterizations to look at uh, how uh, cathode materials, the lattice parameter change, phase transformation occur, and how this process can be completely reversible when you do the discharge of the materials, uh, the, the cathode materials. As we know now that we move towards conversion type of materials, the this type of dynamic phenomena will be even more severe and in fact uh, uh, very, very difficult for us to achieve so-called 99.9% percent of columbic efficiency, which is needed for the long cycle, the batteries, because we are in the thermodynamically closed system. So, um, you know, all the tools that I, uh, our field has been, you know, um, focusing on building became more challenges as we are trying to study the SEI and the CEI of this kind of conversion materials because the bond changes and the volume changes are more severe. And more particularly, we're leaving these uh, kind of uh, diluted electrolyte towards concentrated electrolytes and solvents are changing, salts are changing, everything is changing. So this actually imposed a great grand challenges to our field is how we're going to look at the anode electrolyte interface and the cathode electrolyte interface with the new eyes. So uh, in my opinion, if lithium ion battery is a complex system, uh, lithium metal batteries and the solid state are certainly more complex living systems. Um, and uh, in terms of the intercalation materials, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, I have been really well funded by the DOE Basic Energy Science uh, through the Energy Frontier Research Center uh, for 10 years that we have been really building this multi-scale, multi-model characterization platform all the way from atomic level to single particle level to secondary particle level to electrode level. Uh, so this kind of uh, atomic nano micro to meso scale uh, build this kind of quantitative platform to study battery materials. The whole point is that uh, we have to capture all the changes that happen in the battery materials because in the end, we will have to reach very, very high columbic efficiencies if we want to have the batteries cycle for thousands of cycles. So for material scientists like myself, uh, you know, the platform we build for intercalations really will not work when we move towards um, non-intercalation type of anode and a cathode. However, um, you know, from the electrochemistry perspective, there are things that are not changed. I, I took a slide coming from uh, the ECS short course, uh, Professor Martin Winter and I taught since 2007. Uh, we have to realize how different the uh, SEI and the CEI are because on the uh, SEI side, on the negative electro side, you are always being subjected to highly reductive environment. On the cathode side, you're always being subjected to very oxidative environment. Therefore, the species formation on the negative and the positive side have their own intrinsic characteristics. And we need to realize that if it's in the liquid system, the crosstalk is not preventable. So this shows you the uh, suite of tools that we are using for studying the interface. So today I will only focus on the uh, anode side um, because we don't have time, but I want to emphasize that uh, for studying uh, electrode electrolyte interface in details and in the quantitative nature, we we'll have to realize that there is a spatial resolution limit. There's the heterogeneity nature limit, and there is the dynamic change stabilities due to the state of charge difference. So we have to think about the both electrode that are in the model electrode fashion, and then also practical electrode where we are using them in the real batteries. Uh, a good example to show you is that uh, the uh, electron microscopy was previously very successfully applied in studying the cathode electrolyte interface. This work is almost uh, 11 years old. 
uh, you know, really reviewed the power of electron microscopy, how it helps us to review the surface four to five atomic layer changes. And this insights that gained more than 10 years ago for the cathode materials really helped us to understand the high voltage stability of those cathode materials. And today I want to show you how we can use the uh, microscopy tools to study lithium metal. So the uh, principle of the study is the same. Uh, so we need to understand the previous tools we developed for cathode materials or materials interfaces, how they are not good for the lithium metal or how we can modify the tools uh, for the lithium metal anode. So um, let me just uh, dive directly into the lithium metal challenge. Uh, I think for this audience, I don't have to mention why we have to do lithium metal. Okay, so uh, lithium metal is not a easy material to study because it's so sensitive to everything. So if you look at the ABC first column, uh, this type of SEM picture was everywhere in the literature before 2019, I would say, uh, when you use the guardian iron beam to cut the lithium metal, um, you actually get a severe contamination from the guardian beam because the guardian was actually alloying with lithium at room temperature. Uh, we showcase that uh, you really need to use both cryo cutting and cryo cleaning if you want to study the vapor deposited the lithium metal carefully. So this is a sheet of lithium metal that is supposed to be a dense metallic phase. But uh, if we don't have the proper tools, the lithium metal basically reacts with the guardian ions. And this fit the cryogenic focus ion beam fitting can be done easily retrofit in your machine. And so we will be able to preserve the original state of the lithium metal. And this become particularly important if you're studying electrochemically deposited lithium because the morphology can change drastically based on the electrolyte solvent, the salt, that you're using. So for instance, if I do the 3D tomography cryo fib cutting, the uh, carbonate-based electrolyte that was originally catered for graphite is completely not suitable for lithium metal anode because you will be getting this kind of highly porous lithium metal anode electrochemically deposited. Now, if we change to the ether-based electrolyte, you can see the uh, morphology of this lithium metal, are very big, chunky uh, grains, and you have very, very little porosities uh, in this type of uh, electrolyte. So the first big jump of uh, battery 500 consortium is really changing the entire electrolyte, include solvent and the salts, to the kind of what we call the localized high concentrated electrolyte. And this move is extremely important because without this, we will not be able to uh, uh, make lithium metal batteries cycle more than a few hundred cycles. The second important breakthrough we had in the Battery 500 Consortium is to use cryo-TEM to look at the lithium metal at an atomic level so that we can study the SEI in details. This video shows you that if it's electrochemically deposited lithium at room temperature, if you don't do anything, the lithium metal whisker is changing. That is not because the lithium metal cannot be imaged in the TEM, it's because this electrochemically deposited lithium was covered completely by SEI. And we reviewed in our uh, work early on that you have to develop a very, very carefully the workflow uh, to prepare the TEM samples. Uh, one can choose to use the freeze plunge method, which is borrowed from the biology field, or we can use our material science way of preparing the battery materials to study lithium metal. So lithium metal can be imaged in the room temperature TEM. You can, if you can find ways to isolate it from lithium carbonate, lithium fluoride, all those SEI component. Uh, but in reality, the electrochemically deposited lithium is often covered by this kind of insulated species. And they impose very, very difficult um, imaging. So basically you have to go to 
low temperature to reduce the reactivity of the uh, uh, lithium uh, uh, SEI component under the uh, TEM. So you can use a very low dosage electrons to image the lithium metal with high quality. And the heterogeneity of the lithium metal anode also impose severe constraints on how we can analyze the data. So I just want to show you a very quick unpublished data that you can use uh, uh, concepts that are borrowed from the biology to do high throughput imaging and get a very good sample statistics because it is indeed a very heterogeneous uh, samples. Now, lithium metal uh, characterization uh, is particularly challenging because the high reactivity of the lithium. In fact, uh, in the vacuum, you have uh, you know a lot of reactivity of the lithium with the even in the high vacuums like the SEM, the uh, uh, FIB. Now the low atomic number uh, make it quite difficult, but uh, with the cryo EM, uh, Stanford team has shown you can get a very nice BCC structure of the lithium metal. Now our group has really shown that, that with the cryo EM, you can then image very, very nicely how the spatial distribution of the uh, SEI component with respect to what we call the dead lithium. So the lithium trapped inside of the SEI. So here the top panel is the lithium that trapped inside the uh, uh, high concentration electrolyte. The bottom is those whisker type of uh, uh, lithium metal that trapped in the elongated uh, uh, whiskers of uh, uh, these SEI shells. And this is a really important insight that actually enabled us to think about a better method to quantify the inactive lithium metal because the, the heterogeneity and the poor statistics from TEM, we were then driven to invent this called a titration gas chromatography method to actually quantify how much dead lithium is trapped in the SEI. So the experiment was very uh, simple and elegant in my opinion, you can actually, uh, you know, think about all the solvent and the SEI interactions. If we use water, by the way, you don't have to use water. There's many other choices of solvents, depending on what you want to study. In this case, we want to study the water lithium reactions to quantify uh, the amount of dead lithium. The calibration curve is very, very accurate. We can get up to one microgram lithium metal accuracies. And the study really taught us that uh, in the low efficiency lithium metal cells, the total capacity loss is completely correlated with the hydrogen generation, which means the dead metallic lithium trapped inside the uh, SEI. And the SEI, at least in the low efficiency cells, is not the major culprit. I, it doesn't mean SEI is not important. We just mean in the low columbic efficiency side, lithium metal is not the main reason that, uh, sorry, uh, SEI is not main reasons. Now, if I use the simple schematics to show you why is the reason you wanted to have this kind of a dense, large particles of lithium metal, I think the story is quite a self-explanatory, right? Because the, the SEI, the blue portion is uh, electronically insulating. So if you have this type of elongated particles, you always run into the problems of having a large amount of lithium trapped inside. Of course, you can put on pressure. Um, we showcase that the pressure is so important that you can imagine if you put the pressure and the push those lithium um, towards the uh, SEI, you get a bad and colobic efficiency. And this is clearly demonstrated in our experiment uh, that showcase the importance of stack pressure in, in under any current densities, uh, you have a, a very nice correlations to show you around the 300 to 400 kilopascal uh, in the liquid cell, lithium metal needs certain pressure to actually have those densely packed lithium being deposited. And this effect is even more important when you start to strip the lithium metal. So the lithium stripping, you can see that uh, if I start with the same dense lithium, if you don't put a pressure on it, the stripping, you will have actually very high percentage of uh, inefficiencies. You can do the same interesting experiment with the carbonated electrolyte. 
So you deposit some kind of very porous structure, and then you uh, start to stripping and the uh, step pressure still have a very huge impact on the effectiveness of the, uh, the reversibility of the stripping. So the lesson here really shows us that uh, lithium metal needs pressure control during the depositing and the stripping. And you can do all sorts of in interesting experiment to showcase you know, where is the weakest spot? Obviously, I think by intuition, many people could think of the current collector, copper and the lithium. The interface is the weak spot and we can show proof that this is the case. And if you actually always leave a lithium seed layer there, you can go through many, many cycles with the good pressure control to, to actually deposit and stripping this kind of dense lithium. Um, and we just provide the complementary information to show you the composition of the XPS really is the same. There's not much change, right? So this paper is already out in Nature Energy and uh, I, I will welcome people to read it. And also there is a collaborative work on um, modeling part of work to showcase that um, the lithium metal nucleations really gets impacted by the stack pressure with only around 300 kilopascal. So uh, we then move forward and then read, uh, did this uh, nature review article with uh, Bertar and the Young from MIT. And the, the good news is that uh, we have many electrolytes that can go uh, towards 99.9% .9 columbic efficiency for lithium metal uh, anode. And we also showcase SEI is important when you go above 99.6% SEI become very important. And then we think this is a very, very optimistic uh, pathways for us to think about. We can definitely develop a thousand cycle the lithium metal and uh, lithium metal batteries in the near future, because we have now a much clear understanding about what is the limiting factor in the lithium metal anode. Now, the ultimate dream for all of us is of course to move forward to um, solid state, right? Because we you know, here, even with 99.9% .9 efficiency after thousand cycles, the safety of that lithium metal batteries still cannot be figured out if we're using metal, if we're using liquid electrolyte. So we want to do solid state, but it's not easy, right? Because uh, solid state is actually much more complicated in my opinion. Um, you know, when we look at the sulfide based the solid state uh, uh, batteries, because the solid electrolyte is powder. Right? Of course, you in the lit metallic lithium part, you have a complexity because any void you created is an additional interface. So in our chemical review paper, we pointed out solid state is more complex. You have more interface to deal with than liquid because in the liquid case, there's no void. It will be filled by wet electrolyte. Um, but in the solid state, in the case of algidide, we showcase that uh, uh, in fact, it's extremely difficult to maintain both chemical and electrochemical stability. So all the cathode materials have to be coated. And because of the challenge in the solid state, we actually have to develop a whole suite of tools to study buried interfaces in the all solid state batteries. And I think uh, from nanoscale to micron scale, uh, it is really, really uh, challenging to develop a tools that can look at the buried interface. So I don't have much time left. I just want to showcase maybe uh, one quick example to show you on the cathode side, uh, the coding is very important for first chemical stability, right? Because the oxide and sulfide are not intrinsically compatible. So you need to develop coding materials to stabilize the cathode chemically and then think about the electrochemical stabilities. And in the case of uh, coding materials for cathode, our field is extremely successful. Not only we found nalbate is reproducible, we found all the phosphate, borates are actually really good coding materials and they can stabilize the cathode. The lithium metal continue to be a problem for solid state batteries in all our cells. Um, I would say, you know, at a very low critical current density, something around 0.3 milliamp 
per centimeter square. Lithium metal can cycle if you lower the pressure, stack pressure above, uh, below five megapascal, because the solid state, when we do the synthesis, we go very high pressure to establish the contact, because if you don't have a good contact, you have a lot of void, you have a very high impedance. So the impedance needs to come down and then to have low pressure. But the, honestly, you know, these kind of cells are not practical because the critical current density is so low. So up to today, I have not solved the um, lithium metal challenge. I want to show you the lithium metal anode challenge, you know, LiPon remains to be the best ever compatible solid electrolyte with lithium metal anode. Today, we still do not solve the lithium metal challenges. So I'm gonna skip the LiPon, um, problem just to let you know LiPon is the best. Uh, I couldn't do anything with lithium metal in the algae dyed solid state batteries. Uh, we then move towards silicon. The goal is to use test a hypothesis that in the silicon, I don't put any solid electrolyte in the silicon. I would really like to lithiate the silicon and have the entire anode free of SEI because the whole situation in the liquid is because under gravity, liquid can flow into the pores. So it will introduce lots of SEI, it's a complete mess. And we know that in the uh, liquid solid, liquid systems, silicon loading cannot be above 20% uh, maximum. Here we have a hundred percent, I mean 99.5%, okay? You need a 0.5% of binders. And this experiment was astonishingly successful. And the work is published in Science uh, last year. Um, I think uh, everybody can read those in details, but I just want to point out, we start with this micron silicon, we lithiate on the high pressure and the whole, Lithium silicon will be con um, densified and amorphized. And when you take lithium out, uh, you then still, um, actually today we know there's about 20% uh, of the lithium remained in this uh, uh, anode. And you form that kind of a scaffold. Uh, the volume change is only one first cycle volume change. And then a subsequent cycle is extremely stable that allowed us to uh, go for 500 cycles with 80% retention. So this work showcased that the um, SEI stabilities in the silicon is actually outstanding with this algae-dyed uh, solid electrolyte. And this is the reason we were able to go for very high current density, have a wide temperature range, and also very really, really good area capacity. This kind of area capacity can only be achieved by dry electrode process. Mm -hmm. So we were very fortunate to showcase the complete dry process of the cathode uh, in this solid state battery work. So with that, um, I think I come to the end of my talk. Uh, I have been extremely fortunate to be involved in both the federal uh, DOE funded project, then translate them into a uh, project that are funded by industry. We are sponsored by LG and Shell for the development of all solid state batteries. So in all the work I show you today, the solid state battery work, there is not a drop of liquid because we are trying to understand the fundamental inter state batteries. So with that, um, I thank all my students, postdocs and the colleagues and the collaborators, and thank you very much for your attention. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Meng for your uh, illuminating uh presentation. So uh, now we have uh, time for a few uh, questions. So any questions from the audience? Hi, Shirley. I have a, a very short technical questions for the samples showing the uh, lithium metal, uh, the cross sections. Are these samples all cut by FIB? Yes. All the samples um, uh, has to be cut by cryo fit right. because uh, if you do it at room temperature, actually the contamination is very severe. You will lose this kind of, uh, you can see in our uh, lithium metal, you really see this kind of uh, colander vertical right. grains. Yeah, and yeah. those grains will disappear if you overuse the room temperature cutting. Right, yeah. So this is when thinking in order to get this, you know, that sort of a depth profile, how it goes towards the substrate. This is the only way that you can see, right? 
Yeah, I think I'm afraid that right now this is uh, really important to uh, upgrade all the FIB with the cryo capabilities. I think this is not an expensive exercise. In fact, uh, uh, you know, if you have an FEI machine, they know how to retrofit cryo stages to the right. machine. Right. Yeah. yeah, and it right. does not cost a lot of money. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, this is Zijian. Hi. Hey, Zijian. I'm also, I'm also actually in Australia, so <laughs> in time, same time zone. Right, I, I have a question. I, I think I, um, I, I, I read your papers in the last page of the science paper. Yep. Just wondering, um, because you mentioned that you be able to do a very high aerial capacity and, and, and the silicon is quite thick. Um, just wondering, and you use such a high amount of silicon, how, how do you tackle this? Uh, is there any... any uh, electrical conductivity issue while you are doing charge discharge. Yeah, thank you, Zijian. Yeah, so the lit the silicon is carefully chosen. So we found a vendor uh, in the uh, field, they can produce the micron silicon with reasonable conductivity. So you can see this conductivity measurement here on the slide. Uh, you can, yeah, so it's important to double check the conductivity of your silicon. Uh, it needs to have the kind of nature of like a mixed conductor, right? So uh, remember the first cycle, the system is under very high pressure. So we reviewed in the paper is about 30 to 50 megapascal. So the lithium comes in and the lithium is the silicon will become a mixed conductor. So it's really important at the beginning of your silicon, the conductivity has to be in this range. It cannot be too low uh, because you know, some of those uh, nano silicons has extremely low electronic conductivity and the people might find a difficulty in uh, putting the first few lithium in. So the initiation of the lithium silicon is very important. Right, and then you also mentioned that after you strip it away, Maybe twenty percent of lithium actually stay in the anode. Yes, that, and do you that's mean that the, in the first cycle of a strip, or 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 at the end of a few hundred cycle strip? First cycle, first cycle. Yeah. So okay. we were very very badly criticized by LG, right? Because nobody likes the first cycle has twenty percent capacity loss. Uh, we can only do that because our cathode was dry processed, so we have very very high loading on the cathode. But for practical usage, right now the research is focusing on how do you pre lidiate to make mm -hmm. sure this 20% is handled. And I think that the study also teaches people in the liquid side that pre lidiation is very, very important because uh, I think, uh, you know, I don't believe any silicon companies with high silicon loading without the pre lidiation. I don't believe anyone will succeed without the pre lidiation. Right, right. Yeah, indeed, that's really critical. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So uh, we uh, actually uh, we still have time for uh, some questions. So uh, any more questions? So normally after I teach my class, I will ask everybody to switch on the camera so that I know that uh, people are still awake. <laughs> <laughs> That's my habit as a professor, just uh, to let every all the students and the professors in the audience know that uh, if uh, I'm the one who's hosting the meeting, I will request everyone to turn on the camera. <laughs> to make sure that, that they are still <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> To make sure everyone is still awake, yeah, that's I think one of the major challenges for the virtual world because you know it's uh, really really difficult uh, that to maintain to be enthusiastic after giving a forty minutes talk. Well, I know okay. at least the Zijian and the Tran are awake. <laughs> okay, uh, if uh, no more uh, questions, then uh, let's uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Sherry Meng once again. So uh, now uh, let's move to the uh, next speaker, um, Professor William Chu.